Nutt. You're a neuropsychopharmacologist specializing in the research of drugs that affect the brain and conditions such as anxiety, yeah. addiction and sleep. You're the chairman of Drug Science, a non-profit founded in 2010 to provide evidence-based information on drugs. Sound right? Sound good? That sounds perfect. Your new book is on cannabis, called Cannabis Seeing Through the Smoke. Why are you choosing to write about cannabis and why now in particular? Mm. Well, cannabis is a very interesting drug and it's become particularly pertinent in the last couple of years in Britain because we have seen it turned into a medicine. So three years ago, the government said, oh yeah, we got it wrong. It actually is a medicine. And they allowed doctors to prescribe. But sadly, very few doctors in the NHS are prescribing. And in fact, one of the things my charity, Drug Science, has done is, is set up a, a system, an initiative, which allows people to access medical cannabis without going through the NHS at the same price they pay if they're doing it on the black market. So we're in a, a bit of a crossroads. We've got it as a medicine, but doctors aren't using it. Why is that? Because they don't know about it, they don't understand it. And I thought it was timely then to write a book that kind of laid out the truth about cannabis, about THC, about cannabidiol and also about medical cannabis, the, the herbal plant products as well, which are actually probably the most interesting of all the, uh, the cannabis products. Could you talk a bit more about the benefits of cannabis when used as medicine, when used as a drug, um, that you're trying to inform people about? I mean, cannabis is probably the world's oldest medicine. We've got evidence of it being used in China 4,000 years ago. One of the most interesting things I've discovered about medical cannabis is that the Chinese character for anesthesia is the same as for cannabis. And those characters have been around for about 6,000 years. So it's a very old medicine. In fact, it was a medicine in Britain until 1971. It was used by Queen Victoria to deal with pains of childbirth and, and period pains. And it disappeared in 1971 because eventually the British government gave in to the Americans. The Americans removed it as a medicine in 1934 when, they made, when alcohol was made legal again in America. The, the feds who were attacking the, uh, the underground uh, the alcohol market were then encouraged to switch to attack cannabis. And they basically said cannabis was a very dangerous drug and it had to be banned. And the Americans took it out of their medicine in 1934. And we held on in Britain you know, for quite a few years. But in 1971, we conceded and uh, we, we stopped it being a medicine, despite the vast amount of evidence of it being used before. And of course, what's resurrected it is the fact that there are m mothers, particularly, or sorry, parents of children with severe epilepsy, who, whose epilepsy hasn't responded to any other treatment. And they've learnt that medical cannabis can help them, but they've had to go overseas to get it. They've had to go to Canada, to, uh, to the States or to Holland, and often have spent years living there in order to access this medicine for their children. And about a year ago, we started collecting um, a group. We've got 21 of these children, and we can show overwhelming evidence that medical cannabis, the herbal stuff that with all the entourage effect, is transforming the lives of these children. But still only two of them are getting it on the NHS. The rest are having to get it privately. So we're now in a situation where we, I think cannabis is likely to be one of the great medical innovations in the next 20, 30 years, but, but doctors aren't using it. So doctors aren't fulfilling the, you know, the, the potential of the, of the medicine. Is there a difference in age or background uh, or training between the doctors who do listen to the arguments in favor of cannabis and those who don't? Can you like separate those out? So currently I'm trying to understand why doctors won't prescribe. And there are, there's a structural problem in that when cannabis was made a medicine three years ago, the only people allowed to prescribe were specialists. Now specialists, there are a couple of things that characterize specialists. The first is they're very special and they see themselves as very special people. And they've often done a lot of research and, if, and none of them would have researched cannabis. So they're, they're kind of top of the medical pyramid, but they only do what they know. And that's how they maintain their sort of, I don't know, the status of being a specialist. And this, the syndromes and the, the, um, the symptoms that medical cannabis is good for are largely things like pain and anxiety and, uh, and spasms, etc., which aren't the things that specialists actually are interested in. 
What we should be doing is allowing GPs to prescribe medical cannabis so we can, they could get people off all the other drugs they're using for those conditions and put them on something that's likely to be both safer and more effective. So we've, we, we've basically given it to the wrong group of doctors. In terms of the age, yes, well, I'm finding now that uh, young doctors who are coming into medicine are, are thinking they want it, they're more open-minded because they haven't been telling the world how dangerous cannabis is. But from a, the ones who are over about 35 onwards, they've, they've, they're so used to telling and saying that cannabis is a dangerous drug that causes dependence, it causes schizophrenia, very hard to get them to admit they were wrong and, and, and change their prescribing. What are those myths about the dangers of cannabis that um, you think are most harmful, you know, and, and how do you dispel them? So when cannabis was made uh, illegal, a campaign was set up in the States, and we certainly followed suit, to try to justify its being banned. And initially the campaign was a very racist one. It was, cannabis was actually a Mexican drug and it was renamed marijuana. And back then in the 30s, the, Ameri yeah, the, the US government and the, and the, the, um, the CIA and, the, and, and the, you know, the, the feds were, were telling everyone how dangerous this drug is. The Mexicans were using this drug, coming in and destroying American culture. And I didn't really have much traction in Britain, but in the 1950s, when we started to get a, a growing number of people from the, um, the Caribbean, Afro-Caribbeans here, they started using cannabis. And so there's sort of the kind of slightly racist tint, the sort of fear that, that these people are using something which isn't quite British, it's not alcohol, started to take root and people started to try to find arguments that it was a cultural problem. But that didn't really carry much weight. But then, people started looking at this question of schizophrenia. And, and so it was a kind of British invention that um, cannabis might cause schizophrenia. Now, it probably doesn't, and certainly in those days, it definitely didn't. But what they did was that, that was a sufficiently powerful argument for the government to really justify clamping down very hard on people using cannabis. And of course, what happened then, and this is a, this is a terrible sort of moral story, really, as predicted, if you clamp down on something that's not very harmful, like traditional herbal cannabis, being imported from you know, Morocco or from the Lebanon, what happened? We started to grow our own. So we started to do hydroponic, 24-hour ultraviolet light growing you know, Vietnamese gangs. And what they grew was a much stronger form of cannabis called skunk. And, and skunk has, there are two big problems with skunk. The first is it is more likely to cause psychosis because it doesn't contain the protective element. Herbal cannabis is a combination of cannabidiol and THC. And THC can make you high, but also make you slightly paranoid. And cannabidiol opposes that. But when you grow plants to have very strong THC, the cannabidiol doesn't, can, you can, can't do both, so it just makes THC. So you end up basically getting the unbalanced mixture in skunk. And that seems to have more, certainly has more risk of dependence, and it almost certainly has more risk of causing psychosis. So in an attempt to get rid of cannabis by really criminalizing the use, of the use of traditional cannabis, we've actually driven the market to produce a much more harmful form. And then of course it got worse. It got worse when we started testing prisoners for using cannabis. And then the prisoners switched to spice, to these synthetic cannabinoids, which, which aren't detectable with the same um, uh, chemistry as, uh, as cannabis was detected, and are way more toxic. So all our attempts to prohibit cannabis have actually just led to greater and greater harms from what has replaced it. The, the myths that uh, were created to justify the policy decision came to exacerbate the negative consequences of the drug. It was a two year long research project for this with over 20,000 patients. Is that true or accurate? I'll talk about this, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay, if you talk about that. Yeah. Three years ago when the chief medical officer said, yes, it can be a medicine, we thought, great, let's, you know, we can, Drug science can go and do something else, you know, like try to get psychedelics legalized or made as medicine. And after a few months, we realized that nothing was happening with medical cannabis. And after, we, so we convened a conference and we started talking to, to the patients and the doctors and the, and the regulators. And we realized that actually things weren't going to happen because there was such resistance from the NHS, from the doctors and also from the pharmacists. Because in the reality is in the NHS, you cannot prescribe a, a new drug like medical cannabis would be without essentially a, the pharmacists control it. They, they control the budget. They make the decision. And so we thought, well, let's 
let's monitor the situation. And so we started essentially collecting information on who was getting prescribed. And it became obvious after a few more months that no one was getting prescribed. And then there was a survey done in 19, 2019, which showed that about a million people, over probably 1.4 million people in Britain are using medical cannabis each day, but they're getting it from the illegal market. And there are huge problems there, obviously. I mean, you don't know what you're getting. For one, one week, you might be getting 15% THC. The next week, you might be getting 12. Almost anything you get won't have the cannabidiol in, which is one of the key elements of medical cannabis. And so we thought, well, what can we do to, to, to sort of solve this problem if the NHS won't solve it? So we set up what was called 2021, Project 2021. And we did it with one of the um, charities that represents people who are taking medical cannabis illegally. And, and they had 20,000 members. And so we thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if in a couple of years we could get all those 20,000 people from the black market into the uh, approved market. And, and what we did was essentially set up a, a process whereby they could all access medical cannabis at the same price as they're paying on the black market, which is about 150 pounds a month. And we were successful in doing that by bringing together a whole series of different medical cannabis producers from different countries. And they've all essentially brought medical cannabis to Britain at that price, which is a non-profit level. You know, it's a sort of base price for them. And now already we've got 1,500 people going through the, uh, the initiative. But the really clever thing about it, and the, why it's in a major advance, is when it's not just about getting people medicine, but it's about monitoring how they do, and particularly monitoring anything that goes wrong. So, so we're rating whether they get dependent, we're rating if they go psychotic, because we want to show and we think we will, that if you use cannabis in a medical setting with the right balance of cannabidiol and THC, it not only works and helps people deal with their symptoms, but doesn't cause the problems that have been projected onto cannabis by the, the regulators and by politicians. You've said or written that the West is, in the UK as well, um, one of very few societies that has an open mind towards psychedelics, these psychedelics. Um, you've made it your life's work to start to break down those barriers. Do you sometimes feel like you're not making arguments about psychedelics, but it's more about the nature of the society you're working in? What does it say about Britain or the West that people have been for the last 50 years so close-minded or shut yeah. off to these sorts yeah. of arguments? I started working for the government as a drugs advisor in 1994 when we had a few deaths from MDMA. And that committee was actually quite an effective committee because we basically recommended f free water in all venues, which still happens today. The fact you can always get tap water in pubs or restaurants was part of the process that we put through to reduce the harms of MDMA. And we also recommended chill out rooms. And that was an amazing public harm uh, message because virtually no deaths from MDMA in the, in the subsequent uh, 20, 30 years, except when people tried to stop it and uh, various novel forms such as PMA which are, have come along. But MDMA itself, you can deal with the harms of MDMA sensibly by allowing people to get it in a situation where they can be protected. And as a result of that, I was asked to advise several government committees on how we should deal with uh, other drugs. And I was full of enthusiasm, you know, there was a rational response to MDMA. So let's, I assume there'd be a rational response to other drugs. But I, when I started looking at it, I realized that actually the drugs which had already been made illegal, you could not have a rational discussion about. And why is that? That is because if you try to change the, the legal status of a drug that is illegal, the newspapers, the right-wing press go, in, go insane. So, and of course, the most classic example of that was when um, we were eventually allowed to seriously discuss the legal status of cannabis. Cannabis until uh, 2004, some forms of cannabis were class A alongside crystal meth and c crack cocaine, and some forms of cannabis were class B. And after quite a detailed assessment, the advisory council, which I was on at the time, said they should all be class C. And the newspapers went insane, and they, they desperately tried to stop that happening. But that, um, Blunkett was a Home Secretary at the time, and he, he pushed that through because he realised that that was what the science said.
But subsequently, the, the media backlash terrified Blair and then Brown and subsequently Cameron and uh, May. And since then, gov governments have always been absolutely terrified of loosening, I would say being more rational, about the classification of any drug. And eventually cannabis got regraded, and that's how I got sacked for proposing that. And subsequently now, we've been pushing more and more drugs into the legal category. In fact, under Theresa May, we brought in this completely bizarre piece of legislation which says anything apart from alcohol that affects your brain is actually illegal, even if, even if it's never been invented. So, so it's the drugs, drug laws, are, they, have, they have two roles. They, they fulfill the need of many aspects of the media to, to, to find someone to hate and something to hate and get banned. And then they serve a kind of political purpose that politicians can pretend they're doing something. They can make a law even though the law actually is probably going to do more harm than good. That's interesting. So on the one hand, your career, your research, your roles in government and within institutions has done so much to educate and advance arguments for the use of psychedelics, narcotics. But on the other hand, you've lived through a political terrain where you can have a law passed a couple of years ago by Conservative government that would make illegal anything that isn't alcohol. Yeah. Like, how do you reconcile that are you happy with your like life's work or do you think like wh when are you going to sit back and be you know content? well it is it is paradoxical isn't it yeah, and so i'm always you know we, we're confronted with this bizarre continued banning of things i mean only last week the home pretty patel new home secretary said if the acmd were minded to make nitrous oxide illegal she would put the full force of the law to impose, you know, sanctions against people who use whippets. I mean, what an absurd thing to say for, you know, to, to give people criminal records for doing something, that's like inhaling a balloon, which is way less harmful than getting drunk. But on the other side, and, that, and this is where I, I guess I can take some credit, on the other side, by pushing and pushing the medical value of medical cannabis and now psychedelics and MDMA, we've at last begun at least to have a, there is an, an alternative dialogue. So when I started doing, you know, advising the government you know, 20 odd years ago, you couldn't really say there was a, these drugs had a benefit, even though you knew. If you said it, you would get vilified. Now, people say, yeah, of course, you know, now that everyone accepts they have a benefit. And the question now is, what's the nature of the regulation that will allow them to be used beneficially, but still protect the poor innocent youth from using it? How has your research, along with the findings you've made, impacted you as a person? So, when, I mean, I've been fighting a battle for 30 years to bring a much more rational approach to drugs, to assessing the harms of drugs, but also to assessing the benefits of drugs. And uh, I don't, I mean, I think in a way, I've been kind of quite fortunate because I was put in the position where I, where what I said actually was listened to. They might not have liked what I said, but at least I did have a role, a responsibility as the drugs are, to advise government on drugs. So I think it was perhaps inevitable I was going to be sacked, but the sacking in itself, stressful, I mean, it was a pretty tough year, but in reality what it did was it actually made the debate happen. And also I, was, I discovered there were, you know, most, well, sorry, not most, but a lot of the scientific communities behind me, they wouldn't come out and say so, but they'd say it privately. So I, I knew I was, a, you know, a, a bit of a flag bearer for them. And, uh, and that, that was actually really, in the end, that was really quite satisfying. Uh, and I think I can look back on the last 30 years and say, well, you know, we've actually, for patients, we've moved the field forward a lot. We do have medical cannabis if people want to use it, and, and some private doctors do. And I'm pretty sure we will have medical psilocybin, and we will have medical MDMA in the next few years. And I, you know, I think I've made a significant contribution to both those. Thank you very much.